Hello everybody, welcome to The Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today, I'm talking about album number four from Music, Lunatic Harness. Alright then, first video of 2023, and we're kicking off the year with the big one. I may have already gone over my love for the first three Music albums, but if anyone has ever heard of Mike parodying us before, the vast majority of times, they are going to bring up this fourth album. It is his most popular, well-acclaimed, and successful album by a fairly noticeable margin. Widely considered to be his best and most essential work by fans and critics alike. When I posted my review of Tango Invective to kick this series off like a month and a half ago, it felt like nearly half the comment section there was just talking about Lunatic Harness. Not to say his other projects aren't well loved too, but it feels like this one in particular just totally eclipses all the others for most people. And Paradinas knows it too, it's always brought up whenever there's promo for a new release of his, and it's like the yardstick that everyone always measures any subsequent release by. It is one of those big, iconic all-time classics of IDM, and the album of his that casual fans of the genre are most likely to already know about. Now, on a personal level, while I've also always quite enjoyed this album, I never really felt like I got why seemingly everyone I talked to always highlighted this one as his absolute best. Maybe it was the kind of thing you needed to be there to fully understand. I, I was a toddler in 1997 and didn't properly get into Paradinas until 2014 or so when I was just starting out college. And when I did, I just went through his albums chronologically, which may have led his earlier work to leave a stronger impression. But whenever I put on Lunatic Harness, either back then or now, I always think to myself, yeah, this is really good, but I don't know about his best work. He has so many other albums that are just as good, if not even better, at least like five or six other albums that I personally prefer over this one. I think all three albums he came out before this one are better, heck I probably enjoyed Magic Pony Ride more than this one too. When I inevitably do a worst to best ranking on his studio albums, this one's probably going to end up in the lower half. Now, don't take these somewhat lukewarm sounding comments to mean I don't like Lunatic Harness or think it isn't deserving of the love it gets. I just never really got why it seemed to get so much more love than all his other work. It always felt to me kind of like, it was like, uh, if Square Pusher's catalog still had all these classics, like If Feed Me Weird Things and Hard Normal Daddy and Go Plastic, which were all still remembered fondly, but most people would overlook them and instead go nuts over an album like Selection 16. Which wouldn't be a bad pick for favorite or even necessarily for your starting point, just not what I would have expected to stand out so much to people, I guess? I do have a slight theory that Lunatic Harness was the one that people remember best because it was the one that got the best promo. It, it saw him releasing on a major label through Virgin and Astral Works, and without using any of those pesky sample things which might have limited how far a project like In Pine Effect could go. And I will also not deny that this album is markedly better produced and well polished from like the mastering side of things compared to his previous work. Not quite as abrasive sounding, and slightly more subtle, with far less clipping audio. Though I've also seen this album described as the closest Paradinas had come to making pop music up to this point, and... Uh, I'm gonna have to disagree on that point. I, I might actually argue the exact opposite. Even though these tracks are slightly more polished in terms of their production, and they do in fact pretty much all have really nice melodies, all his previous albums also had nice melodies and ones that were a lot more likely to get stuck in my head than these. If anything, the material on this album always felt markedly more abstract and winding than a lot of the comparatively more straightforward ideas he'd explored previously. It's more cerebral and subdued while still being as bright and frantic to still be recognizable as the work of Mike Paradinas. It's also a lot uh, more focused specifically on the whole drill and bass sound that his colleagues on the scene were really starting to get into around this time. So you got a lot more break beats and faster tempos on average. But I mean, besides that, you wouldn't really notice that much had changed. Right off the bat, you get a good idea of what you'll be getting into with the opener Brace Yourself Jason, which hits you with all the crashing breaks, grooving bass lines, and plinky synth xylophone melodies, including a few moody sidetracks into some uh, more 8-bit-like bleepy synth arpeggios, and another sidetrack into some sped-up James Brown yelps. Relatively nice and chill material, but still hitting you with a lot of interesting ideas. 
And then you're hit with arguably the biggest fan favorite in Hasty Boom Alert, which honestly doesn't provide nearly as much of an explosive experience as the title seems to imply, instead delivering a fairly straightforward but cold and moody set of pads and squirting melodies going over its usual mix of skittering breaks. Whenever I hear this one, it always makes me think of like some square pusher tracks from years later like Tomorrow World or Planetarium. That's always nice, but as much as I enjoy this one anytime I put it on, I don't think it ever really stuck out to me as like a big personal favorite. There's even been listens where it, it kind of just blended into the previous track without me noticing. That's kind of the thing about this album. It has tunes for sure, but those melodies have a tendency to just like meander more wherever they please without really forming much of a hook. And hey, maybe that's part of why it works better for certain people. They're definitely more complex, if you want to call it that and uh, catchiness doesn't necessarily need to be the part of the appeal of this kind of music. Just for me, that can occasionally lead to these tracks falling into the background a bit more easily in spite of all the various ideas they run through. All these tracks did become easier and easier to recall uh, the sound of from a distance with more and more repeat listens, but it took a few years for this stuff to really grow on me, and even then, the, the album can occasionally be a slight bit of a mixed bag for me. While there's no tracks I'd outright want to skip, perhaps with maybe one exception, there are definitely some that hit more than others. As for what that one exception is, that, that would be the track Wannabe. That track seems to be like a bit of a, like a joke cut where Paradinas makes fun of the Spice Girls track of the same name that was presumably getting totally overplayed on the radio at the time and basically turned it into a creepypasta, taking an intro of all these unpleasant mechanical noises and eventually leading into this heavily filtered whispering Wanna be a lover, baby? I don't wanna be your friend. I mean, it's kind of funny the first time you hear it, but with every successive listen, it really does start to grow a little stale. And the whispering parts in particular just seem to drag on and on, even though the rest of the track around it is fine, and I guess has some neat enough metallic atmosphere like some certain cuts in the middle of Tango Invective. It's not the worst thing I've heard from him. It is not on Mr. Angry level of skip. Other tracks I could take or leave include uh, Blaineville, uh, which has some nice cheerily melodies and foot-tapping percussion, but also has this super unpleasant and oily buzzing bass which totally stomps over everything else in the mix and yet still ends up feeling a bit lacking in punch or body. Doesn't quite work for me. And there's also London, uh, which features all these screechy synth strings making some really dissonant harmonies over various other ghostly synth whales and hyper-distorted industrial percussion. Can add up to a bit of a cluttered cacophony, though this one isn't a skip either. There is something neat to how disorienting it can all be, and again, it's in like the same way as some of those more metallic sounding cuts on Tango Invective, and better detailed and stuff, I guess. But at the same time, you also got some other tracks which are much bigger winners, uh, especially in the earlier parts of the album. Like you got uh, the bubbly lead melodies of Mushroom Compost, which are among the most easily memorable uh, of anything that appears on the album. Do -do 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 -do. And going over its uh, fairly off-kilter beats and uh, more subtle but playful plinking xylophones. I really like that one. Uh, I also really like the various excursions through chopped up beatboxing in the title track that has time for some side tracks into some mildly grooving, wiry melodic lines. That one goes pretty hard. Uh, there's also the ever so slightly jazzier tones of My Little Beautiful, which features all these dreamy loops of electric pianos going over some especially crashing breakbeats with some particularly distorted kicks. There's also the strangely alluring, almost instrumental hip hop of Catkin and Teasel. Uh, which features all these various textures ranging from some chopped up loop from what sounds like a movie soundtrack or something, going up next to the usual glitched up breaks and even a few thicker jazz bass lines and some whistling piccolo-like melodies on the side as well. That one is probably the uh, last um, really major highlight for me on the album. But with enough repeat listens, I think actually my favorite track in the bunch ended up being Approaching Menace. Uh, ironically, the loudest and noisiest track in the bunch. Now, if you know my taste in uh, noisier material, you wouldn't necessarily think that would be my thing, uh, especially from how intense all these distorted break beats and that super thick buzzing bass is. And I'll admit, I don't know if I, I don't remember if I was sold on it on first listen. I don't think I was. But man, does it go hard in the most fun way. The buzzing bass is way more visceral and gritty and better implemented in this kind of mix than it was for something like Blaineville, which was, uh, it, the bass on that one just kind of felt a little out of place more than anything. 
and it ha and this one has the extra benefit of even scratching a little more of that uh, square pusher itch uh, with some particularly spooky whistling melodic licks, do -do -do, do -do -do, and airy movie soundtrack synth string pads. The final effect isn't too far away from something you'd hear on Feed Me Weird Things, amped up on steroids. It it's freaking great. Other tracks of note include the two-parter Secret Stare, uh, neither part of which is either a big favorite or a big least favorite. They just deliver a lot of nice, spooky synth strings, which uh, remind me of Old Fun Number 1 from his last album. Going over the same mixes of moody pads and breaks as a track like Hasty Boom Alert. I do like how there's a trade-off between the two parts, with the first part being darker and spookier and the second part being more lively and cheerful. Though I do think all of those elements are done even better on the album's closer, Midwinter Log. Uh, which takes a lot of the same sounds and delivers them over an even better detailed mix that has a fair bit more progression over time. Finishes things out on a satisfying note, and tracks like these with all the synth strings perhaps might even act as a slight bit of foreshadowing for where he'd end up going on his next album. Oh yeah, and I should uh, also probably mention that a few months ago, uh, this whole album saw a 25th anniversary reissue with an entire second disc of bonus material mostly pulled from two uh, promotional EPs connected to the album, My Little Beautiful and Brace Yourself, uh, with a couple of rare tracks on the side. Should probably also go through my feelings on that material as well, since it is just all there in the same package. The first three tracks on the bonus disc are from the My Little Beautiful EP, uh, Hanky Pokery, Jiggery Panky, and Worcester. <laughs> The former two of those also got repurposed into his Ebris with Marine Archive album in 2016, and are generally fine for what they are, delivering various mixes of chopped up breaks, moody and funky melodies, and some interesting progressions, though they uh, disappear from my head pretty quickly. Uh, Worcester is a lot more striking though, in its mixes of plinky synth vibraphones and various breaks that seem to ever so slightly fall out of sync with each other. I do quite like that one. The next run of four tracks weren't on any old related EPs, but uh, The Cut of My Jib was also previously released on that Ebris with Marine album. It's a nice enough mix of melancholy melodies, synth flutes, and some slower breaks which have a lot more crash cymbals in them. Do quite like that one. But the next three are just alternate mixes of tracks I've already talked about. Uh, there's two alternate cuts of the track Lunatic Harness. There's an original demo version which has all the same beatboxing but some very different uh, sets of melodies which aren't as good, uh, but kind of remind me of, I guess, the organs on his track Zombies. And there's a Lunatic Harness remix uh, which diverges the beatboxing into yet more different territory that uh, gets markedly darker than the original and glitches up the beatboxing way faster and more frantically which should be saying something. And then after that, there's a remix of Mr. Angry of all things, uh, which chops up the original drum patterns to treat them as if they were a standard drum and bass breakbeat, and I guess also tries to do some more interesting chops with the screaming baby sound effect too, time stretching it, pitching it up and down, filtering it to sound like spooky ambience in the first half. Uh, the screaming is still really annoying, but you know, it is less annoying than the original. And the last eight tracks on the bonus disc make up what was originally the Brace Yourself EP, uh, starting with a Brace Yourself remix uh, that sounds almost nothing like the final version that made it onto the album. It's way more cheery and upbeat, and some parts of it sound like Aphex Twin's Flim on crack. From there, you get a somewhat forgettable mix of sneaky movie soundtrack pads and skittering beats in Cubba, a mix of low-key ambient melodies going over brittle hip-hop beat in Vacant Bolt, which gets built upon in a much more layered and frantic way in Loser's March. That one has a lot more acid synths and this one particularly happy sounding section with marching percussion and synth clarinets that almost uh, borders a bit on sounding like Plone or something. Uh, then we get uh, the much warmer and more straightforward Summer Living 2, which has uh, a lot of nice melodic pads and wearing German bass effects, which sound kind of like the ones that show up on stuff like Goldie St. Angel or something. There's the slower breakbeat workouts of Intellitag, which features more chill and carefree ambientish melodies. That track does actually sound like it could be his equivalent to Flynn. There's a slow swirling ambient mix of uh, synth woodwinds and very slow hip-hop breaks in the Abmoit. And uh, then we finally close with Brace Yourself Reprise, uh, which takes the melodies from the remix and repurposes them into a bit of a slow and bouncy lullaby type track. 
that happens to also have faster pace distorted breakbeats thrown in. That's a nice fitting way to close this long and winding journey out. The whole bonus disc admittedly doesn't read to me as essential as the bonus material on Tango Invective. Probably not going to come back to this stuff, but all of it is nice if you happen to be interested. But as for my final thoughts on the original Lunatic Harness itself, it's a very good album. I still think it's a little bit overhyped, and I still wouldn't mark it as among my biggest favorites of his albums. But even if I did used to be uh, weirded out by the relative amount of hype this album gets in comparison with his others, and still kind of am, with enough repeat listens, I do at least feel like I understand all the people who do mark this as his best work. It is probably his densest album that shoves in as many ideas as his older albums, but compressed into a slightly tighter package. It's 70 minutes compared to an hour and a half, but still. <laughs> it still doesn't have any of my all-time favorite moments from him, and it's uh, very much the kind of album that it needs to be sat with for a, a long time. The more cerebral focus of this album isn't necessarily the kind of thing I tend to come to Paradinas for, but I suppose it is the sort of him showing some more versatility in the approaches he'd take with his albums and reinventing himself a bit with each project a streak which would start to become a lot more clear from the next album onwards. I still don't personally love this thing, but I can absolutely respect its classic status, which leads me to feel a very strong 7.5 out of 10 on it. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters, there are some people, you want to add yourself that list, links to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.